Welcome back. This time, I'm going to cover the Rorschach test. Specifically, I'm going to describe the test protocol and present the tenth plate. For each plate, I will read the accompanying directions verbatim. After reading the directions, I'll provide some information on the most popular responses. This video is going to be a voiceover so that you can focus on the plates. As is the case with any test, Rorschach's test is more than a bundle of materials. It consists of 10 cards presented to a subject in the context of certain instructions and procedures, as well as rules for scoring. The subject's perceptions of the examiner's wishes and motives, as well as the goals and motives of the subject, helps form the content of the testing. It will also help determine what the subject says. For these reasons, the variability in instructions among the common systems is unfortunate. Obviously, instructions and procedures must be consistent with one's ethical and professional responsibility to respect the patient's autonomy, beyond that the administrative procedures should be minimally intrusive to avoid establishing expectancies beyond the most complete possible reporting of the subject's thoughts. For these reasons, the examination should begin by clarifying its purpose. When the testing is based on referral, the identity and the role of the referring professional should be explicitly clear, as should the nature of the report and the party or parties to whom it will be accessible. When the subjects are being tested for training purposes within a service setting, a school, clinic, or, or hospital, it is important to clarify what extent a report will become part of the subject's record and what access he or she will have to it. It is also important to provide a means for such subjects to have answered retrospective questions about themselves or about the answered. For example, a graduate student might say, Hello, Mr. Tukey, I'm John Jay, a graduate student in clinical psychology. As part of my training, I have to learn to give certain psychological tests, and I appreciate you volunteering your time this way. Because this is a training exercise, there won't be any reports of the results in your school, clinic, or hospital records. Before we start, are there any questions you have? If questions occur to you at a later date, you can call Dr. Jones at 977-7777. The standard practice is to keep the various sources of clinical interferences as separate as possible, so often clinical interviews are conducted separately. Such interviews can be very informative, but are best done by somebody other than the tester whenever possible. For the seating arrangement, it is recommended that the examiner positions themselves so that the subject handling of the card can be observed, and so that the examiner may comfortably write down the subject's response responses and note behaviors. The position generally used is one which the examiner and subject are approximately side by side at an angle of approximately 45 degrees. The logic behind this position is that this allows the examiner to observe accurately while affording some privacy in recording. The purpose of the instructions is to establish a consistent set in the minds of the subjects being tested. The basics to be covered are that the patient will be shown 10 non-representational stimuli and asked to report all associations to them. The standard protocol is approximately this. I'm going to show you 10 cards, each containing a picture of an ink blot. I'll give them to you one at a time. I'll ask you to look at each card and tell me what it looks like. Spend as much time as you like on each card, but be sure to tell me everything that occurs to you. If the subject fails to give an association and tries to return the first card in less than two minutes, the examiner is to say, give yourself plenty of time. Most people see several things on each card. If the subject only gives one response to the first card and also spends less than two minutes searching for additional responses, the examiner is to say, give yourself plenty of time. Most people see more than one thing on each card. This urging procedure is to be repeated, if necessary, on the second card, but not subs subsequently. Requests by the subject for permission to turn the card or to respond only a part of the blot are acceded to as simply as possible. A yes will usually suffice. The principle of minimal intrusion by the tester holds true for most questions subjects pose about administration procedure. On the next slide, I will present the 10 plates. For each plate, I will read the accompanying directions verbatim. After reading the directions, I'll provide some information on the most popular responses. These popular responses are based on three studies. Beck and Petrowski both used American samples, whereas Dana used a French sample. Their results were similar. When seeing card one, subjects often inquire on how they should proceed, and questions on what they are allowed to do with a card, for example turning it, are not very significant. Being the first card, it can provide clues about how subjects tackle a new and stressful task. It is not, however, a card that is usually just difficult for the subject to handle, having readily available popular responses. The most popular responses were butterflies, moths, and bats. Some interpretation manuals prescribe that the response, animal face, suggests paranoia. The red details of card 2 are often seen as blood and are the most distinctive features. The responses to them can provide indications about how a subject is likely to manage feelings of anger or physical harm. This card can induce a very variety of sexual responses as well. The most popular responses were two humans, a four-legged animal, Nearly 50% focused on the gray aspects and often said that they saw a dog, elephant, or bear. 
Card 3 is typically perceived to contain two humans involved in some interaction and may provide in information about how the subject relates with other people. Specifically, response late latency may reveal struggling social interactions. The most popular response was two human figures, over 70% focused on the gray aspects of the plate. Card 4 is notable for its dark color and its shading, posing difficulty for depressed subjects and is generally perceived as a big and sometimes threatening figure, compounded with the common impression of the subject being in an inferior position, looking up to it, this serves to elicit a sense of authority. The animal or human content seen in the card is almost invariably classified as male rather than female, and the qualities expressed by the subject may indicate attitudes towards men and authority. Because of this, card four is often called the father card. Over 40% of responses were related to animal hides, or skins, or rugs. Card five is an easily elaborated card that is not usually perceived as threatening and typically instigates a change of pace in the test after the previous more challenging cards. Containing few features that generate concerns or complicate the elaboration, it is the easiest blot to generate a good quality response about. The most popular responses were related to butterflies and bats. Texture is the dominant characteristic of card six, which often elicits association related to interpersonal closeness it is specifically a sex card. It's likely sexual percepts being reported more frequently than any other card, even though other cards have greater variety of commonly seen sexual contents. Similar to plate four, the most popular responses were related to animal hides and skins. Card seven can be associated with femininity, the human figures commonly seen in it being described as women or children, and this functions as a mother card where difficulties in responding may be related to concerns of the female figures in the subject's life. This center detail is relatively often, though not popularly, identified as a vagina, which makes this card also relate to feminine sexuality in particular. The most popular responses were related to heads or faces. People often express relief about card 8, which lets them relax and respond effectively. Similar to card 5, it represents a change of pace. However, the card introduces new elaboration difficulties, being complex and the first multicolored card in the set. Therefore, people who find processing complex situations or emotional stimuli distressing or difficult may be uncomfortable with this card. Popular responses included four-legged animals. Virtually everyone, over 93%, focused on the pink shapes. Characteristics of card nine is its indistinct form and diffuse, muted, chromatic features, creating a general vagueness. There's only one popular response and it is the least frequent of all cards. Having difficulty with processing this card may indicate trouble dealing with unstructured data, but aside from this, there are a few particular pulls typical of this card. There weren't many popular responses for this card. The only way one I could find was from the Beck study, which noted that some individuals saw a human figure in the orange blot. Card 10 is structurally similar to card 8 but its uncertainty and complexity are reminiscent of card nine. People who find it difficult to deal with many concurrent stimuli may not particularly like this otherwise pleasant card. Being the last card, it may provide an opportunity for the subject to sign out by indicating what they feel their situation is like or what they desire to know. Many people love this card, probably because it is so vibrant. Popular responses include lobsters, spiders, rabbit heads, and caterpillars. And that's the last plate. Next, I'll talk a little bit about the inquiry process. The purpose of the inquiry is to obtain any necessary further information about the subject's responses for the purpose of scoring a record after associations have been obtained to all 10 cards. Typically, the administrator chooses to defer the inquiry until after the free association phase is complete because to introduce it after the first card tends to make subjects more cautious. It is usually best for the tester to minimize any defensiveness or anxiety the patient might feel by taking the responsibility on himself for needing additional information and by carefully avoiding the implication that the patient's performance has been inadequate or faulty. A second principle is to obtain any necessary additional information with a minimum of biasing structure being introduced. Avoid suggesting or encouraging the use of specific justifications. At the same time, do be sure to inquire about each element of the percept. In general, we begin the inquiry as follows. Okay, now that we're done, I'd like to go back over the cards with you to make sure I got your responses straight. Let's see, the first thing you saw on this card was blank. 
The tester then looks up expectantly, providing an opportunity for the patient to talk further about the response. This opportunity will usually elicit sufficient additional information. If the patient does not respond at all, the tester should say, tell me more about that. If sufficient information is still not elicited at this point, the tester should say, what about the blot brought that to mind? If sufficient information is still not available, we conclude that it will not be forthcoming without the introduction of biasing structure. Be sure to inquire about each salient aspect of the response, indicating in your notes in parentheses what you asked about. For example, free association, a scary bat, inquire, why a bat, why scary? The tester should specifically avoid asking the patient to trace the outline of the percept, which, which biases towards form, and asking about the importance of specific variables. For example, was the color important? Modifications in testing procedure are used in testing children five and six years old. Because this age group usually has not been well socialized into structured task performance, and because social expectations are less clear, it is necessary to be more explicit in informing these subjects of what is desired from them during the inquiry phase. Therefore, if sufficient scoring information is not forthcoming following the standard inquiry procedure, the examiner should ask directly for location and should repeat instructions such, but what exactly about this ink blot makes it seem like a bat? Exactly where did you see the bat? Very young children will, will often have difficulty justifying their responses by objective criteria and may only have a vague notion of where the response is located. Further pushing is therefore not fruitful and runs the risk of suggesting correct answers. For materials, use plain 8.5 by 11 inch paper turned sideways with three columns marked off on one each sheet. The first column should be about 3 quarter inches wide to record the card numbers and the latency. Latency is the time that elapses between receiving the card and the first response to that card. Count with seconds in your head, do not use a watch. The notations need not be exact. The second column should be about 4 inches wide to record the free association. Record only 3 or 4 responses per sheet, leaving space in between them. Number each response in succession. Be prepared with 10 or 12 sheets for each administration. For each response, note in which position the card was held when the response was given. Use carrots with the point of the carrot in the same position as the top of the card. For example, the upturned carrot would indicate the card was held in normal position, while the downturned carrot would indicate that it was held upside down. The left pointing and the right pointing would carrots would indicate that it was rotated a quarter turn. All cards turning should be indicated. A circular arrow is usually used for this purpose. The third column should also be about four inches wide to record the inquiry. Put each response directly across from the free association response, which it corresponds, labeling it with the same number. It is suggested that ink be used in the recording, the free association, and the inquiry. The response sheets must be, must be written so others can read them. The subject's name should be written on each sheet. It is helpful to train oneself to write legibly during the administration so one not need use time recopying. There are numerous scoring systems for the Rorschach. Many of these systems are proprietary. However, I can share general categories from the Bernstein Lock scoring system. First is location, which is the blot area and frequency. There's cognitive complexity, the perceptual approach and organization. There's justifications, which is the blot attributes alluded to. Imaginal aspects is the imaginary attributes. Social appropriateness, the degree to which the response is characteristically found in grossly disturbed individuals. Conceptual content is the type of percept, which is, can be animal, vegetable, mineral. There's interpersonal expectations, the complexity and quality of conscious human-related fantasies, and less conscious general expectations. There's psychosexual drive and defense effectiveness is a psychoanalytical derived. Perceptual cognitive characteristic, thinking style not scored elsewhere. These nine areas form the Burstein lock scoring system. According to this system, these nine are the areas important to the assessment of the psychological functioning of the subject. All right, so that wraps up the Rorschach test, and now you know too much about the Rorschach test procedure. Thank you for watching.